Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Hal Stern. I'm the Dean of uh, Donald Brand School of Information and Computer Sciences at UC Irvine, and I am your MC for the morning. Uh, we, we need to have kind of a hard stop at noon since everyone's going to want lunch then. Uh, so I, I'm going to get us started and uh, keep us moving on, on time. Uh, a couple of introductory comments. This is a real multi-purpose event. Uh, we have an element of UCI meets IBM and interacts with IBM. Uh, we have an element of IBM professional development. Uh, we have an element of IBM recruiting UCI students, um, all three of which are wonderful, wonderful activities. Um, Neil Sahota uh, approached me uh, during the summer about doing an event. I'm not sure how to characterize Neil. He's either UCI's ambassador to IBM or IBM's ambassador to UCI. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> Neil has a, is an alum of our school and a couple of other schools at, at UCI that we won't mention. Uh, but he's an alum of our school and we'll take pride in that. Um, but I thought it sounded like a great thing and we're really happy to participate. Uh, we've reached out to colleagues in engineering in the business school um, where IBM also does a lot of work. And so it's a partnership that's very important to UC Irvine and we're happy to play, play a part in it today. Uh, as everyone knows, IBM I is a, a wonderful company, has really remade itself over time, and at the moment, uh, a big push there is tools to assist in software development. So what we thought we would do I is kind of put together uh, a couple of IBM talks about some of their tools and new developments at IBM with a couple of UCI talks about what goes into software development. And so I'm going to introduce the first speaker, who's the chair of our Department of Informatics, uh, Professor Andre Vanderhoek. And he does some really cool and novel work on how uh, a design tool for sketching that goes into software design. Sorry. Andre? Thank you. All right. Well, well thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I, I should immediately say some of this work actually benefited from IBM that I'm going to show you. Um, so. Uh, the grad student who worked on this spent two internships at Watson um, and did some of the work that they did there on design sketching um, and transitioned some of the work that we did on design sketching into some of the tools that were about business process sketching. So um, it's just great to be able to talk about this. Um, I'm actually not going to show the tool to the disappointment of many. Often I will actually give a live demo, but given that I only have 20 minutes, I'm going to try to stick all the slides in the 20 minutes. So let me first talk about what do I mean by software design sketching. And there probably is just no better way than to just hit the play button on this. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so this is software design sketching, right? So who are you looking at? You're looking at two of the architects of Adobe Illustrator. Um, so two of the main four architects that we recruited for a workshop to participate. So they let us actually videotape them in the process. Notice they're not designing Adobe Illustrator, they're designing something about the intersections and a traffic simulator and other kinds of things. But this is what I am really, really interested in. Why am I interested in software design sketching? I'm really interested in software design sketching because most design work seems to happen not at my tool, but seems to happen at the whiteboard. Right? That is where many, many major decisions in software design are made, yet we have very little understanding of how those decisions are made how the developers work, and whether we can actually support them in this process. Because when you think about the whiteboard, it's a really nice tool, but it doesn't do anything to help us. Right? I can add things, and I can erase things, and it's the only functionality that this design tool has. Yet, it is a preferred method for many, many software developers, as opposed to other kinds of tools that they might have available. So what's going on here? So, got interested in this about seven years ago and did that by starting to collect pictures like this um, where I talked to our alumni at a variety of companies and said can you just show me your whiteboards will you be able to, to send those to me um, so this one is coming from a company at Mirth um, and this is a software design session and actually what they're drawing here is a patient room a patient room an intensive care unit they're drawing the hospital and they're actually trying to understand the problem while they're trying to work on the solution, right? So they actually draw things side by side. And so once I started getting more of these kinds of pictures, I started going, this is becoming interesting, right? So, so what does this look like? Um, well, this is an incredibly important uh, whiteboard, also again sent to me by one of our alumni um, at Hortonworks, where they, they are major contributors to Hadoop, um, the, the big parallel uh, infrastructure. And this whiteboard has pretty much the design of their system on it in lots and lots of different pieces and bits um, that they every once in a while will actually go back to. And so we kept collecting these, and then we started wondering, what's going on? How do they work at these whiteboards? 
And so for that, we actually organized the workshop where we, we managed to talk our way into a number of companies and said, could you give us your best designers? Could you just give us your best designers for about three hours? And a whole bunch of companies actually did. And we showed up, and then we talked to the designers, and we brought a couple of cameras. We have a little two-page design prompt. Would you please go to town and work on this? And they all did, which was really just fabulous. They gave us their time. And then the lunch afterwards was, of course, much more important because we actually got to talk about what they did, their day-to-day -day practices, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and so we collected videos. And these are two people from a company called Amberpoint. Um, where they worked on this design prompt for this traffic simulator for about two hours um, and collected all of the videos and analyzed all of those videos in a great amount of detail. So the student actually sat through all these videos, coded them, looked at them, and started trying to figure out what are some of the things that we can learn from these videos. Okay? And so we did that in the following way. We started building these things called design documentaries, sort of summaries of what we saw happen in these sessions. Um, how we did that, I'll, I'll leave, up to, leave up to the papers that we've all written about it. Um, but then we started doing things like this. We started saying, okay, can we track the ideas? So who's actually contributing the key ideas to the design that is there? Um, and so this is a visualization where at the end, um, that's the end of the session, and then we actually have in blue one person and in red the other person. And even though one person clearly dominates at the whiteboard, because almost always there's this one person who stands up and dominates at the whiteboard, we can see that the contribution of the ideas is actually fairly even. So the person sitting on the side is contributing to the design sessions, is contributing to what's happening. And we can also see that the ideas, every once in a while, build upon really old ideas. So we had something early on that later on we start building back upon. So we started tracing how these ideas actually emerge and what happens. And so started to, you know, there, there's a long paper about this that talks about these ideas and how they, how they play out, how they contribute, how the discussion happens. Um, but the important thing is it's balanced and it always refers back. And of course there's ideas that we lose because they're, they're not so good. We started also looking at this, which we call shifts in focus. So if we look at the whiteboard, where are they actually looking? Are they constantly looking here and they're working something? Or are they here? Are they switching back and forth? So we started asking where is their focus? And it turns out that their focus, if you look at this particular diagram, if you look at a 30 second sliding window, just over 30 seconds of that video, most of the time they'll be focused on one that kind of part of the diagram, but about 30 to 40 percent are actually focused on two parts of what they're working on, and sometimes even three parts. If we extend that to a five minute window, we actually see that the majority, or that the highest number is five different parts of our design. So in these five minutes, Actually, what's happening is we're not completely focused on this one thing that we're trying to solve, which is what you, what we kind of initially expected, because when you look at how they're working, it seems like this is where they are. But they actually are switching back and forth among different parts of their design problem quite significantly. Um, and then, you know, we can see that they draw lists, they draw maps, they draw tables, ER diagrams, class diagrams, and that's what they are actually moving back and forth amongst. And many of those shifts in focus, as we call them, are really fast. So many of them involve like a three second glance, of up to a three second glance of to another part of a whiteboard. Just checking something and then coming back to, to the task that we were doing. But it's very, very important that it happens. Sometimes it's just gathering information. Sometimes actually it's verbally referring to something and saying that's why we're doing this, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So but these momentary glances are an important part of what we're doing. Um, and then the last one that I'll show you, um, out of the initial set of analysis, was rotating subject pairs. So we actually did this experiment with professionals, and we did the experiment with grad students. Okay? So the professionals are the ones at the top, and what you can see is that often there's this double bar. And what the double bar means is they're talking about two parts of the design problem at the same time. So they're not talking about how do I design the car, or how do I design the road, how do I design the intersection. They're actually talking about how do I design the car moving over the road? Or how do I design the intersection actually being connected to the other part um, of or, or connecting multiple roads? So they do this consistently. But what we also see is that they rotate these subject pairs. So for a little while, they're talking about this one. Then they pick a different pair, then a different pair, then a different pair, then a different pair. It's almost like they're pushing their design up little bit by little bit, making sure that all parts stay in sync as they move forward. And they don't do this on, you know, on, on command. This is what happens in the flow of the conversation. This is not explicit. They're not there, hold on, 
we're done with this subject pair, let's go to a different one. It's all moment in the in the actual conversation. And you only start learning that when you really look at the words that they're using. Now these are the grad students. So for the grad students in the room, I have disappointing news for you, you behave very differently. Um, and how you behave differently is you tend to actually pick a single subject and then spend an extraordinary amount of time trying to understand how this single subject actually works. Um, so the design tool that we're proposing for the grad students is after five minutes just automatically wipe the whiteboard clean and force you to start anew. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and we're half joking, but in many ways we're actually very serious. Is How can we now start intervening and saying, well, this is clearly not a behavior that experts have. Can we bring somehow the behavior of experts into the behavior of novices and in the classroom and other kinds of things? So, so what we wanted to achieve with these studies, these preliminary studies, is starting to see, for me personally, of course, how do I bring some of this in the classroom? How do I help the students in my class become better designers? And these are some of the evidence that we're now gathering that allows us to say, here's how you should behave, here's what you should do. But up until this point, um, all our analysis were sort of like opportunistic, saying, okay, what can we find from the data? And so once we started to find interesting things, we started to actually saying not just, you know, what did they draw and how did they draw it, but what purpose does it have? Are there behaviors that we can see across all of the design sessions that we capture um, that these professionals do regularly? Um, and the good news is there's a whole bunch of them. And we've started to call them design behaviors. So design behaviors are recurrent. It happens multiple times. Recognizable set of actions serving a single purpose within a design meeting. So a contained, small, short activity that we do in this design meeting. And there's a whole bunch of them. So I'm not going to go into detail on this particular slide, but there's about 14 that we've partitioned into the kinds of sketches that they draw, the navigation that they make amongst those sketches, and how they collaborate. And so I have a couple of iconic representations of some of those examples. So one is they draw different kinds of diagrams. If you study the whiteboard and you really look at where they're focusing, it turns out that there's different parts of it that serve very different purposes. So here they have a set of objects, or here they have a set of objects, here they have a set of requirements. This was the user interface they were working on. This was a little bit the problem domain, trying to figure out what happens if something like this happens. So they draw these whiteboards, but the whiteboards have very significant parts that serve specific roles um, in, the, in the design exercise. Um, they only draw what they need and no more. Now this is a big graph. But basically what it says is if they're working on an entity relationship diagram that has a couple of entities and relationships, they will draw a box. They might draw a title. They might draw a few little things, but they typically don't draw the full notational detail that the, the design notations that exist prescribe. So a UML diagram or an entity relationship diagram or user interface has some of the elements that look like it, but certainly doesn't become a fully specified detailed diagram on the whiteboard as we know it when we're working in a design tool, right? So when you're working in a design tool on your desktop, it says ER diagram. Could you please give me the title? Could you please tell me what the arrow means? Which arrow is it? Um, and so we started looking at that in more detail. And then it turns out that they get there, but they get there fairly slowly and they don't get there fully. So here's an example of one of the things that stands out to us as, as very significant of why current tools actually don't support as well as designers. So this was early on in, I think, the Adobe session, where they said, well, we need a model, and we need to have an intersection of car, and we need to worry about time. That, and that was about 10 minutes into the design session. About a half hour later, one of the designers drew the boxes around it. And those boxes signified something. They signified that these things were no longer just considerations in this design problem. They'd actually become kind of classes or objects that we were interested in modeling further. And about a half hour later, it looked like this. They'd actually taken what initially was a list of considerations, then became a box set of things, into what looks a little bit like a UML or entity relationship diagram. There's a couple of methods, there's a couple of arrows, there's a couple of relationships. But what is important is that this happened really, really slowly. Right? Any tool that you currently work on your desktop wants you to work like this. But that prevents you to do all the creative stuff early on. And so the whiteboard is the facilitator to actually transition from what is much more informal early on to something that becomes more formal, but certainly not fully formal, later on. And that's an important function that it serves. 
because I can easily erase this, but this becomes a lot harder to rework. And so having this kind of informal transition is, is an underpinning of every single design session that we analyze. Um, they juxtapose sketches a lot. So this is a great example of looking at the UML diagram, but also looking at the sketch of the intersection that is a problem representation test. So if this car is here, and the right is, light is red, then that is going to happen over there. And when that happens over there, this car can now can move, right? So they're using multiple diagrams at the same time. Again, a major strike in many ways against our current design tools. Because our current design tools say you can make a user interface mock-up here, or you can do a class diagram in this other tool with this other notation. But you can't have them up at the same time. You certainly can't work at them at the same time. Whereas that is what the designers do all the time. They have mixed content on the whiteboard, and that mixed content is very important to the design session. So when we're thinking about creative design, that's what's happening here, why they, they run to the whiteboard. They do a lot of mental simulation, where they're, where they're walking through the design and saying, so the car drives here, how does it go over there, what happens? So they're mentally simulating whether the design that they're working on is actually doing what it needs to be doing. And much of that is actually supported by the sketches, where they're pointing to them, where they're walking their finger over the sketches. But none of that is actually, or very little of it is, actually recorded on the whiteboard. Just about 9% involves actually creating new sketches. Most of it is drawing in the air. Um, and then they switch between synchronous and asynchronous work. When they're working together, often there's one person driving and the other person is watching. But every once in a while, one person goes, me, um, and grabs the other pen and starts working on their own independent idea and says, later, let's try to bring this together. Well, I had an alternative that I was thinking about, and I couldn't wait for you to finish your thoughts, so I just grabbed the pen and started working. Um, so when we start looking at this collective set of over 14 design behaviors that we now have collected, and we look at existing software design tools, then this is the whiteboard and pen and paper. That's that free form kind of exploration that we have. And this is the fully featured design environments that we all are used to getting on our desktop or getting on, on you know, now our cloud-based <coughs> deployment environment, whatever it is, but they are on the heavyweight side, right? And so what our research then became about is can we build a tool that sits here? So one that mimics the, the fluid creative experience at the whiteboard, but starts building support for you so you can manipulate those images and you can work with those images. So we build a tool called Calico. Um, it's sketching as if on the whiteboard. These are electronic whiteboards. It works on a tablet. It works on, a, on PCs nowadays, too, because you can draw on them. You can sketch as if you're on the whiteboard. You can manipulate those sketches in advanced ways. They're very, very fluid and easily, rapidly manipulable. Um, the sketches are all persistent. They're all kept, so you can move back and forth between them. It's fully collaborative, so we can have multiple tablets all joining the same session and we're working together on the same design. And it's fully distributed, so anybody can be anywhere and actually participate in the design session around this interactive whiteboard experience. Um, so the features are four. We've designed about 150, um, but over time we've always distilled them down to very few features that actually do the work. Um, so one is scraps and connectors, which is you encircle something, it becomes an object on your whiteboard. That's simple. And then that object is movable, stackable, relatable, and a bunch of other things. Um, and the object keeps the shape that you drew, unless you want to actually refine it. We have a cluster view which relates the sketches that I make with an intent. So when I say, I need a new sketch, I need a new canvas, it says, how does this relate to the previous one? And if I say, oh, that's an alternative, or this is a continuation of this design problem, it actually builds this history where I can see how my sketches relate to each other in the background, in a graph like that. There's a little palette where I can take the things that I draw and put them in there and pull them back out. So rather than a design palette that is pre-populated with UML elements, this is one that I can populate with my own elements, which turns out to be incredibly important in the design exercise. And there's a little highlighter. You highlight something and after a little while, it fades. So the features are designed to support these design behaviors, of course. So here's how they map. I won't go into detail, but together they actually amplify these behaviors. Um, and then we did an actual in-the-field evaluation. So rather than doing this in the lab, where we did plenty of it, um, we deployed it to a, a commercial company that does uh, open source software for healthcare. 
Um, we put it in a design firm up in San Francisco called Cooper Design. Um, and a research group used it between here, UCI, and Carnegie Mellon for about six months. And so we actually put it out there, we trained them, and then we captured all the logs of what they did and talked to them afterwards. Um, so here are some of the things that they did. Um, so here they're designing um, the middleware. Here they're actually refactoring code. Very different use, unexpected use of the whiteboard. They, they snapped an image, put it in there, and then in color started to redesign the code. Here you can see the kinds of sequences of whiteboards that they built. So they actually could walk through and say, first we did this, then we did that, then we did this, and now the decision is this, right? So you have a history that's automatically captured. Um, the interaction design group did something very different. They captured all these images of uh, people that they interviewed and then tried to condense them into different personas. Um, so it's also a design activity. It's not a UML diagram, but nonetheless, the board really helped them to move these things around. They could take this, make a copy with one click, and then move the images around to regroup them in a different way. So it made their life just a lot easier. Um, and this is what the research group did. Of course, you notice that the professionals had simple diagrams. Researchers, of course, got to do something more complex than that. Um, so we were designing, or the group was designing, a serious workflow uh, that involved crowdsourcing software development and how do we support that. And so. They were doing a lot of work in there. Um, they designed some user interfaces for debugging and a bunch of other stuff. So, so the takeaway is that there's a lot of variety in the kinds of things that they did with these whiteboards, with this tool. The behaviors, when we started tracking and analyzing what they did, um, we could see that the, the research group did almost all of the behaviors with the features. Um, the interaction design group didn't do some of them, partly because they were co-located. Um, and the open source group, the commercial company, did many of these behaviors again with the features that we designed. So the features actually supported them in what they wanted to do. And I just want to show one, because um, they talked about drawing in the air, right? So you, you do this mental simulation. Well, this group um, had this simple diagram. And this is what they spent half an hour doing and explaining to each other, here's how it's supposed to work. And so this is all the traces of all the highlighter, the fading highlighter, between two groups at a different location. So if you're at a different location, you can't really point to and say, this works here, that works there, that works there. So they were using the highlighter to illustrate the flow of information in this particular architecture. And this is a half hour worth of design activity just captured right there. And that's all they did, talk about how does this simple event bus actually work. Um, so the results are, the designers moved beyond using Calico as just a whiteboard, right? So they could have used it as any regular whiteboard, adding content, removing content. But they started using the advanced features that were there. So the features, that's an initial bit of evidence that the features actually were considered useful by them. Um, a really broad range of design work happened across the groups. The feature use was as intended, um, though there were also creative, unexpected uses of the features. Things that they did that, we, that they were they refactoring, they were bringing in code into the environment that, you know, to us speak of the value of the tool that we've built because now they actually started to explore what, what the boundaries are. And an overall feeling that it helped design, when we talk to them, you know, it's hard to quantify, I created now a better design or I created it faster, but a real overall sense that this actually helped the process a lot. Um, so the current status, it's publicly available to anybody. Boeing is actually in use at three sites across the US where they used to pick up a team, fly it to the other location to work together. Now the teams they put and actually are using Calico um, between them. It's being commercialized by the grad student. He's spending time in his basement um, as any good startup really should do. Um, he's been doing that for about a year now. Um, it's getting close to actually coming out of, out of development into a beta phase. Um, so that's gonna be really interesting. Um, and of course, much remains to be done. So um, what, I'm, what I want to do is I want to move into now those desktop tools give me active feedback about my designs, right? They say, this is good or this is bad. Can we do that with sketches? Can a sketch sort of start coloring red and say, no, I don't feel very good? Um, or can two components start sort of moving away from each other because they don't feel compatible? Um, interesting things that we could do there. But much more important so is the discovery, discovery of good design practices. Now that we're capturing all of these design sessions, can I go back and analyze them and start learning what good design practices are? Because that's the question that I started with, and that's what this tool is starting to allow me to do. And then promote those to the students that are there. 
right? So they actually bring the things into the classroom, bring the tablets into the classroom, build features into the tool to allow them to do that. Um, and that's where I'll stop and say thank you. And clearly, this is not my work. It's a really large group of people that has been behind this. Um, that's where I'll stop talking. So thank you. Thanks, Andre. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Don't be shy. Yeah. When, when will this be available? Uh, when will this be available? Um, <laughs> so the research tool is freely available okay. and, and is built towards, you know, it's usable and, and it's stable and it runs, so otherwise Boeing wouldn't be using it. Um, the, uh, the, the commercial version is probably, we're looking for our first 10 to 100 users in the next one or two months. Um, and one of the ten is most likely going to be Martinelli. He doesn't know this yet, um, but Martin is one of the IBM uh, fellows who did a lot of work on Rational. Um, and so him and I have conversed a lot, and I'd like him to actually be one of the ones because he's here, um, and he works with lots of people across the U.S. So, any other questions? Well, we can talk more afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Andre. And that's an important point is the speakers will be around and around for lunch. So uh, if you don't have, if you have a question that doesn't get a chance to get addressed uh, during the session, uh, please seek out the speaker later. Uh, I would like to, um, I was in such a rush to get us going this morning, I neglected to thank a couple of people that I should have thanked, so I apologize. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, especially thank Frank Ye from IBM and Kristen Wirth from UCI. Uh, for helping organize all of today's activities. So, Kristin, Frank, thank you very much. <laughs>